Mayor Tori, could you please turn off your camera? Thank you. Uh, it's saying that it's waiting for the host to sign in. Oh, am I? Welcome everyone to the 2022 International Holocaust Remembrance Day event. I'm Eric Freiman, president of Osgood's Jewish Law Student Association. I'm pleased to welcome law students from seven Canadian law schools, as well as lawyers, professors, deans, and everyone else joining us today to hear from our incredible speakers. Remembering the Holocaust is important today as it is, has ever been. And as a grandson of a survivor, I could not be more honored to be hosting this event. Today, the chat will be closed, but if you have questions for our survivor, please put them in the Q&A. It is a great pleasure now that I invite Osgoode Hall Law School's Dean, Mary Condon, to speak. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to all of you joining us today. I'm Mary Condon. I'm the Dean of Osgoode Hall Law School. Before we begin, Osgoode Hall Law School acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron, Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably care, share and care for the Great Lakes region. I'd like to sincerely thank the executive and members of the Jewish Law Students Association for organizing and hosting this important event for the benefit of the Osgood community. This day of remembrance is important because it reminds us not only of the genocide and inhumane treatment of so many Jewish people during the Second World War, but also of the importance of honoring the memories of those who perished by redoubling our efforts to treat everyone with humanity and dignity and to work to prevent violence and discrimination against all who are targets of hatred. I am pleased to be joined today by my fellow deans and vice deans from the faculties of law at the University of Ottawa, the University of Western Ontario, the University of Toronto, the University of Windsor, Queen's University, as well as the Lincoln Alexander School of Law. 
In particular, I also want to thank the JLSA for assembling such a large group of distinguished speakers to address us today. And I'm honored to introduce the first of those speakers today, Mayor John Tory. Mayor Tory is very well known, I'm sure, to all of you this afternoon. He's, of course, an alum of Osgoode, and he has held many important leadership roles during his long career in private and public service. He was first elected mayor of Toronto in 2014. We are delighted that he's been able to join us here today. So welcome, Mayor Tory. Can you please unmute your microphone? There we go. I, I began by thanking the deans and by thanking the law associations and the distinguished speakers who are taking part and saying that this, this is an important day, a very, very important day in the calendar of all of the people of Canada uh, and many beyond Canada, but all the people of Canada because of what it represents as an opportunity for us to not only, as the dean said, honor the memories of those and, and, and remind ourselves of the atrocities uh, that took place, but also to put it into a contemporary context in terms of making sure that we do everything we can to uphold our Canadian values and to stop what I see as a very troubling uh, trend uh, that uh, seems to have a greater prevalence of uh, polarized discussion of, yes, hatred and discrimination. Um, you know, I was going to say seeping in, but that may be an understatement to uh, the Canadian firmament. And it goes back to, uh, you know, starting with remembering what happened and remembering how it happened and remembering who it happened to and honoring the memory of those who perished, but also recognizing the intergenerational uh, impact that's had. One of the things I've learned about in, in my public life has been about the intergenerational impact of many things that happened many years ago, some before the Holocaust, uh, but th there is an, an intergenerational impact. We see that and we hear that from uh, survivors who are actually survivors themselves and from the children and grandchildren of survivors. And I think for all of these reasons, uh, it's important to to remember today the lives that have been impacted, were impacted and continue to be impacted by something like the Holocaust and then to make sure for the benefit of those uh, born well after that time that we tie it uh, to today's, uh, today's circumstances and to making sure that of course, uh, this never happens again. The Holocaust showed us what can happen when you let hatred and discrimination uh, to, and, and to, to, to dominate. When you let it dominate, dominate, it's not because you allowed it to happen, but because when, when society allowed that to happen. And it is uh, it's through the stories of people like Eva Mizell, who, who has been so brave and so courageous as to tell her story at schools and all kinds of different places on video so that people can understand from somebody like that firsthand what happened. But it does um, you know, continue to impact people uh, to this day. And uh, I think it is important that we continue to do our work uh, to tackle this. And, and it, that also includes the work that we have to do right here in our city today and in all the cities represented uh, on this uh, virtual uh, gathering uh, to uh, push back, to fight back. I, I use the expression sometimes in my own discussion, including a very excellent gathering we had earlier this week of all the mayors from the biggest cities in, Can in Ontario to you got to speak up, you got to stand up, you got to show up and you have to act. And I can tell you here in the city of Toronto, because I'm so um, consumed with the responsibility that comes with being the most diverse city in the world, that you also then have to make the biggest effort uh, of all to make sure that that is something that is not only inclusive, which of course is a goal that we all share, but also is going to push back against those who would hate, those who would discriminate. And that includes the uh, prevalence of anti-Semitism right here in our own city. You need here no more than the fact that hate crimes uh, as a as, uh, put out by the police in their own annual report increased by 50% uh, in the last couple of years. And that included uh, an increase in reported, reported hate crimes against uh, members of the Jewish faith. Um, and that's reported hate crimes. And that is uh, putting the Jewish faith yet again uh, at, the, uh, at the top, I regret to say, of the list of those who were the victims of this kind of thing. 
And this continued through 2021, and it makes it more importantly, since that's very current information, that this is not some threat of the past. This is not something that could happen in the future. It's something that is happening today, and we have to make sure that we eradicate that. And the events like this and events which remind us of history, honor those who were the victims of this in the past, are also going to help us to uh, strengthen our determination to fight this going forward. And we're doing a number of things I won't catalog for you here in the city of Toronto, uh, including awareness campaigns and a whole anti-hate rally uh, policy so that we can actually move uh, to try and deal with these kinds of things uh, and, and a whole host of things. And uh, a Jewish advisory circle to be a permanent body to not just wait for the next event to happen has been established and we'll meet for the first time in February to help us to deal precisely with this kind of thing. The hate crime unit at the police service has been doubled in size. That's a sad commentary in its own way, but I think it, it should perhaps give people some hope that we're going to take, uh, the police are going to take a, uh, an even more activist approach in trying to deal with this uh, for the reasons uh, that I've mentioned. So I think we are reminded of the fact we need to do more. We're reminded of the fact that the war against anti-Semitism and hate and discrimination of all kinds is an ongoing permanent uh, thing that we will have to do because of the human condition. Uh, and, and we're reminded of that in part by the fact that we can see and we can feel and we can hear of real scars that are left from history, uh, from history that we must uh, learn from in this instance. And I think in so doing, we make a pledge to continue uh, to educate future generations about that history so that it can galvanize them into continuing and further the action that we've all uh, taken uh, against all forms of hatred and discrimination and, and against any thought or act of genocide including, of course, uh, the, the history of the Holocaust. So I want to, again, thank particularly Eva, but thank all of the survivors and all of their, uh, their uh, descendants uh, who are so brave in making sure we don't forget about these uh, events that happened in our history and to tell you that I am an ally and someone who will lead in the process of making sure that Torontonians uh, and their government do everything they can to work together to make sure that this uh, shameful part of our history our collective history is never repeated. And I thank you for the time you've given me today. Thank you, Mayor John Tory, for those words. My name is Karen Drake. I'm Osgood's Associate Dean Students, and I'm honored to be included in this meaningful event. It is ever more important to remind ourselves of the lessons the Holocaust has taught us in light of the horrifying events that took place in Texas recently. I hope that we can all take the lessons we learn from today with us into the rest of our lives. That is why I'm so honored to have Erwin Kotler with us today. Mr. Kotler is Canada's Special Envoy on Preserving Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Anti-Semitism. He is also the International Chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Centre for Human Rights, an Emeritus Professor of Law at McGill University, former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, and longtime Member of Parliament and an international human rights lawyer. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Kotler, over to you. Thank you, Dean, for those very kind words of introduction. May I begin by commending you, uh, the Dean, and the Osgood Hall Jewish Law Students Association for organizing this timely and significant forum on International Holocaust Remembrance Day. In the presence and participation of Mayor Tory, other law deans, and in particular, our guest speaker, Eva Meisels, who is herself saved by Raoul Wallenberg. As you may know, I have a particular affinity for Osgoode Hall Law School. This was my first teaching position some 51 years ago and the friendships that I made with faculty and students in those days have endured for decades. I also want to say that Osgood Hall Law School has conferred uh, three honorary doctorates on political prisoners that I've represented, including amongst them, Anatoly Sharansky, formerly of the Soviet Union and was released not long after that, uh, Nelson Mandela, who came, became Canada's second honorary citizen, and also an honorary doctor conferred on Nasreen Sutada, the iconic Iranian woman human rights lawyer, whom I trust we will yet see her release. As it happens, we meet today at an important moment 
of remembrance and reminder, where we mark the 77th anniversary of the liberation of the death camp Auschwitz, the most brutal extermination camp of the 20th century, a mass laboratory, laboratory for mass murder where there are no graves. 1.3 million people were deported to the death camp Auschwitz. 1.1 million of them were Jews. Let there be no mistake about it. Jews were murdered at Auschwitz because of anti-Semitism, but anti-Semitism itself did not die at Auschwitz. And it remains the bloody canary in the mine shaft of global evil today. And as my colleague Ahmed Shahid, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief has put it, anti-Semitism is toxic to democracies, an assault on our common humanity. From mid-May to the beginning of July, 1400, mid-July 1944, 440,000 Hungarian Jews were deported to the death camp Auschwitz. In mid-July 1944, Raoul Wallenberg, later to be known as the hero of the Holocaust, a man who demonstrated how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront evil and prevail and transform history, arrived at the Swedish legation in Budapest in mid-July 1944. For the next six months, through a combination of inspiration and ingenuity, of bluff and bravado, Wallenberg mobilizing others and together saved 100,000 Jews. So while the entire international bystander community stood by, while the 440,000 were deported to the death camps, Wallenberg, as I said, saved 100,000 Jews. In doing so, he also presaged what today is become known as international humanitarian law. In the distribution of Schutz passes, diplomatic passports, he conferred diplomatic immunity on its recipients, while in housing them in safe houses, provided them with protective sanctuary, thereby developing the remedy of diplomatic protection. Secondly, in establishing soup kitchens, hospitals, orphanages, providing <clears throat> the elderly, the sick, women and children with a semblance of human dignity amidst the horrors of the Holocaust, Wallenberg presaged what today we call international humanitarian assistance. In rescuing Jews on a death march or on a death transport to the Auschwitz death camp, Wallenberg exemplified what today we call international uh, humanitarian protection. But it is perhaps his last rescue that was the most memorable. As Nazi generals were marching on the Budapest ghetto, housing 70,000 Jews, threatening to blow it up and liquidate its inhabitants, Wallenberg warned them that if they were to proceed, they would be held accountable for their war crimes and crimes against humanity and arguably executed for their crimes. The generals desisted, the Nazi generals desisted, and 70,000 Jews were saved by this alone. To Adolf Eichmann, the mass murderer, the death murderer, as he's been called to organize the transports to Auschwitz, Wallenberg was the Judenhund Wallenberg, Wallenberg the Jewish dog. But to Holocaust survivors, like Eva Meisels, who spoke just before we began, Wallenberg was the guardian angel. When Wallenberg was asked why he did what he did, he answered modestly, for me, there was no other choice. Regrettably, the man who saved so many was never saved by so many who could. When the Soviets entered Hungary on January 17th, 1945 as liberators, rather than welcome Raoul Wallenberg as the rescuer and liberator that he was, he was arrested, imprisoned, and disappeared in the Gulag. While Soviets first denied any knowledge of him, then maintained that he died in 1947 of a heart attack, then maintained that he was murdered in 1947, our International Commission on the Fate and Where Whereabouts of Raoul Wallenberg that I chaired 
determined in our report in 1990 that the evidence, and this was so declared in a court case in the United States, that the evidence that Wallenberg was alive after 1947 was incontrovertible, that the evidence was compelling that Wallenberg was alive in the 50s and 60s. And so we are embarking upon, when I say we are, Ra Wallenberg Center of Human Rights, we hope in concert with the countries of Wallenberg's honorary citizenship being the US, Canada, Israel, and Australia, along with Sweden, to make a final and determined effort to determine the real truth as to what happened to Raoul Wallenberg and secure finally justice and peace for Raoul Wallenberg's family, for those many thousands saved by him, for the legacy to the international community as the hero of humanity. I'm pleased that Canada in its country pledges to the Malmo Conference has called on young people to learn about and thereby act upon Ron Wallenberg's humanitarian legacy. And to set aside January 17th, 1945, Ron Wallenberg commemorative day for that purpose. And I'm delighted therefore that Eva Meisels is your guest speaker today, a Holocaust survivor who was saved by Ron Wallenberg. Because Eva, who I've known over the years, endured, as Holocaust survivors did, the worst of inhumanity, but somehow found in the resources of her own humanity, the will to go on, to build families, relationships, and to thereby be a beneficiary and a contributor, to be a, be a contributor, and we are the beneficiaries of her enduring contribution to Canada. And so may this day be not only an act of remembrance, which it is, but may it also be a remembrance to act on behalf of our common humanity, as inspired by Ra Wallenberg and by Holocaust survivors like Eva Meisels, saved by him, who continue that heroic legacy. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erica Chamberlain. I'm the Dean at the Faculty of Law at the University of Western Ontario. And I'm really honored and inspired to be here and to know that we are joined by so many bright minds from law schools all over this province, joining together for this important event and conversation today. The UJA's Holocaust Support Fund is a great cause that allows Holocaust survivors to live with dignity, comfort, and security. The level of poverty amongst Holocaust survivors is almost double that of other Jewish seniors. And it's estimated that there are 2,300 Holocaust survivors in Toronto who struggle to afford basic necessities. The money that we raise today is going to make a real difference in their lives. So if you haven't donated yet, please consider contributing to the fund. We're here today because we recognize the importance of honoring the victims and survivors of the Holocaust, studying the law, Studying legal ethics and professionalism is about more than simply taking a course. It's about thinking critically on our history. It's about identifying how historical issues can arise in new forms in our society and how we will address those ethical problems individually and together as legal professionals and as citizens. I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Daniel Peniton. Daniel is a historian, curator, and heritage consultant from Toronto. His work has appeared in several Canadian and American publications, too many to name them all, but to name a few, the Literary Review of Canada, the Globe and Mail, the Walrus, and the Canadian Encyclopedia. He holds master's degrees from Queen's University in History and the University of Toronto in, mass, in uh, Museum Studies. In 2018, he was awarded the Ontario Historical Society's Russell K. Cooper Award for Excellence in Public Programming. Today, Daniel is the manager of the Online Hate Research and Education Project. Please welcome Daniel. Hello, uh, good afternoon. It's a privilege to be taking part in this program for IHRD. As mentioned, uh, my name is Daniel Panton and I manage the Online Hate Research and Education Project at the Sarenheim Neuberger Holocaust Education Center here in Toronto. 
I was given the honor of providing a brief overview of the lead up to the Second World War and the Holocaust for context for our, uh, prior to our hearing from Ava Mizels, who I know we're all here to, uh, primarily to learn from, so we'll get right into it. The Holocaust is a sprawling, multifaceted topic that touched upon every country in Europe and several in Northern Africa, involving numerous linguistic and ethnic groups. To fully understand the subject, one needs to look both to its German origins, but also to how it played out in different national contexts. Local particularities often had profound effects upon how the genocide functioned and how deadly it was. For example, compare Poland, who lost 90% of its Jewish population, to France, who lost 22% of its Jewish population. This evening, we'll be hearing from Eva Mizels, who was born in Hungary in 1939, a, a country that lost 68% of its Jewish population, despite being one of the uh, last nations to be hit by the genocide. The Holocaust began in Germany. Scholars disagree on when to date the beginning. Some argue that the Nazi seizure of power in 1933 marked the start of the Holocaust, others for the implementation of the first Nuremberg laws in 1935. Some believe that Kristallnacht in 1938 marks when the actual genocide began, while others point to the invasion of Poland in 1939. The Nazis took power in Germany in 1933, rising on a platform of anti-communism, anti-Semitism, and extreme nationalism. This was a party that promised both revenge and revolution, a simultaneous restoration of a glorious past and the establishment of a new future. Nazism was an inherently anti-Semitic ideology that understood Jews to be a racial group, one that had immense influence over the world. It blended more historical forms of anti-Semitism, like the conspiratorial framework provided by the infamous forgery, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, with the pseudoscientific racial theories of social Darwinism. The Nazis believed that the mythical Aryan race belonged on top of international racial hierarchies, and that the Jewish people, external to this hierarchy, were the, quote, parasitic group preventing natural order from taking shape. Hitler wanted vengeance over the First World War and to expand the boundaries of Germany through conquest, which would provide the space for the Aryan people to expand and survive. This Lebensraum, or living space, included much of Eastern Europe and Russia. The first concentration camp was opened in 1933, nearly immediately after the Nazis took power, and was used to house primarily communists and anti-fascists. Two years later, the Nuremberg Laws began rolling out, introducing strict limitations upon Jewish participation in both public life and on their own uh, personal lives. As the decade progressed, more laws were added, furthering, a, furthering the goal of isolating Jewish people from society. In November 1938, Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, took place in Germany. This was a nationwide state-coordinated pogrom, launched nominally in response to the assassination of a German diplomat by a Polish Jewish teenager living in Paris. Estimates vary. Early reports claim that there were 91 Jewish deaths in the violence, but modern analysis puts the figure much higher. The historian Richard J. Evans estimated that there were 638 deaths due to suicide after the pogroms. On the 1st of September, 1939, Germany invaded Poland, triggering the start of the Second World War, and arguably the Holocaust. Their imperialistic expansion would result in the creation of 2,500 labor, transport, and death camps across Europe and the near total decimation of local Jewish communities. Some nations saw their governments collapse under Nazi conquest. Others saw them collaborate for various, often intertwined reasons. We now turn to the particularities of Hungary leading up to the war, which witnessed what some historians have described as the final act of mass murder during the Holocaust. Hungarian politics in the 1930s were characterized by a hard uh, turn towards extreme right-wing politics, in large part in response to both the ravages of the Great Depression and in response to the attempted Hungarian Communist Revolution in 1919. The nation developed a strong nationalist Christian identity that extolled a particular vision of the nation while rejecting communism and liberalism. This helped shape an environment in which vigilante violence was common. In 1920, the right-wing government set quotas limiting admission of Jews to university. This is 15 years before the Nuremberg Laws. As standards of living dropped through the Depression, Hungary continued to swing to the right, and in 1936, the Hungarian prime minister informed German officials that he would establish a more Nazi-like one-party government in Hungary within two years. However, he actually died that year without achieving that goal. 
In June 1939, the Hungarian voters gave the Arrow Cross Party, the third highest number of votes, which translated to 29 of uh, 260 seats. For context uh, on our speaker, that July, Eva Maizels would be born in Budapest. In September 1939, the Hungarian government allowed German troops to transit through the country on their way to Romania, and that November signed a pact with Germany, Italy, and Japan. Anti-Jewish laws similar to the Nuremberg laws were passed during this period. In April 1941, Hungary supported the Nazi invasion of Yugoslavia, annexing several territories, and eventually supported the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union, collaborating in the killing of Jewish people along the way. Local Hungarian officials also assisted with the deportation of roughly 22,000 Jewish Hungarians from over 100 communities in 1941. Until the spring of 1944, Hungary was home to the only major Jewish community still largely intact in Central Europe. As the war turned against the Axis, the Hungarian government agreed to send Hungarian Jews to Germany for labor. That, gov uh, that government was deposed after the Germans occupied Budapest. Germany had been pressuring the Hungarian government to deport its Jewish population since 1943. Uh, the Nazi proxy government legalized the Arrow Cross Party, which had been banned at the start of the war, and they used Hungarian civilian, military, and police authorities to ghettoize and deport an estimated 440,000 uh, Jews to Auschwitz-Birkenau, where most were murdered upon arrival. Arrow Cross rule brought about a reign of terror and infamous atrocities like tens of thousands of Jews being shot into the Danube, ri Danube River or dying on death marches occupy prominent spaces in Hungarian Holocaust memory. In July 1944, the regent of Hungary, Miklos Horthy, stopped the deportations and ordered Adolf Eichmann to leave the country. The Arrow Cross government fell in January 1945 as the Soviets approached and, the co and conflict would continue in Hungary until April. According to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Nazis and their local collaborators murdered 565,507 Jewish Hungarians, the vast majority in just a few months during 1944. Uh, so I'll wrap up uh, this introduction now, but before I do, I wanted to briefly mention the Neuberger Holocaust Education Center's renewal project. Founded over 35 years ago by Holocaust survivors, the center will be relaunching in spring 2023 as the Toronto Holocaust Museum with a state-of-the-art facility on the Sherman campus. The revitalized museum will continue to share the narratives of the Holocaust through the lens of Toronto's survivor community and be a space for dialogue about the Holocaust's contemporary relevance. The museum will continue to run forward-looking programming like the Online Hate Research and Education Project and building the bridges to multicultural communities that are so vital to keeping Holocaust memory alive in the coming age. Thank you very much for your attention and for joining us this evening as we honor our commitment to never forget. Take care. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, my name is Penelope Simons. I'm the Vice Dean of Research at the Faculty of Common Law at the University of Ottawa and the Gordon Henderson Chair in Human Rights. It's a great honor for me to be here at this important event and I'm speaking to you today from Algonquin, Algonquin Territory. It's so important for us to continue to remember this terrible event and to remember and honor those who died, survived, and also who acted to resist the Nazi regime and their collaborators. This brutality crystallized international political will to develop international laws with the goal of preventing this from happening again. And we know that this has not been enough. In the current climate in which authoritarian leaders are being emboldened and white supremacy is on the rise, we need to do more to protect human rights and prevent the rising tide of anger and hatred against religious and racial minorities, against women and gender diverse persons and against other marginalized individuals and groups. In this act of remembering, I'm very honored to be introducing uh, Holocaust survivor, Eva Meisels. Eva Meisels was born in Budapest, in Hungary in 1939. She was an only child and after her father was taken to a forced labor camp in 1942, she and her mother were sent to the Budapest ghetto and eventually to a safe house. They obtained false papers from Raoul Wallenberg and were liberated by the Soviet, Soviet army. And after the war with her family reunited, Eva was able to, uh, went back to school and, and immigrated to Canada in 1956. So please join me in welcoming Eva Meisels. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Eva Meisels, and I would like to thank everybody for coming to this presentation. Um, I was born in uh, Budapest, Hungary in 1939. And um, I can tell you that, that um, whenever you will have a chance to speak to any survivor, every one of them will have a different things to tell you. Some of them were in concentration camps, some of them were uh, uh, hiding, some of them were dying on the way to the camps. Try to think about it when they were pushed into the wagons in Greece and it took them how many days until they reached the concentration camp and they had taken out a lot of people who had passed away by then. Um, I would like to show you some pictures of my family and the life before the war. That was my father's family and the tallest young man on the right side picture is my dad. And on the left is uh, his only sister. And I have uh, children and grandchildren who are named after the people who had passed away. This was a picture of my mother's family. And um, in the Jewish religion, if you are Orthodox, where my parents came from, Orthodox families, uh, the women, when they are married, they have to cover their hair. So uh, in the back row stands my mother, and in front of her, you'll see a beautiful little girl who happened to be me. That was my parents' wedding picture in 1938, August the 14th. And I think they looked very dashing and beautiful, except all the clothes that they were wearing were borrowed from other friends. These are the first pictures of, from my childhood. And on the left side, I'm trying to hold on to be able to stand up, but please don't even think about that, what I was holding in my pants. I have no idea. Uh, here again, we received some packages from North America from distant relatives, and I was a very proud owner of a sailor suit and also a doll carriage with a doll. I can still remember that vest I'm wearing on the left side picture where I am with my mother. It was made of white Angora. It was beautiful. I loved that. Now, this picture is very special for me. <clears throat> My parents enrolled me in pre-nursery in 1942. And on the bottom right, you see me and my girlfriend who is still living in Hungary. And <clears throat> excuse me, she's the one who found this picture in her parents' belonging when they passed away. And she sent that to me. It's a picture of a Hanukkah party that we had in the pre-nursery. Uh, then start, we lived a fairly normal life up to that point, but at the beginning of the war, the rules came in against Jews. Um, they were not allowed to go to have for higher education. A lot of them were fired from their jobs, including my father, and um, they were not allowed to travel on trains, streetcars, anywhere. And these things affected us very much because um, in 1942, they took away all the young Jewish men. They gave them no guns at all. And they were herded in front of the um, regular army. And they used them for um, as minesweepers. In those days, there were no minesweepers yet like today. And, uh, if one of the young men had stepped on a mine and blew up, they couldn't care less because it, they knew that there were a lot more Jews coming behind them. And uh, they were using them for digging uh, ditches and things like that. So my mother and I were left without my father. And um, one day a lady showed up in our apartment and she was a neighbor of my grandparents. 
my grandmother and grandfather thought and believed that the Jews of Hungary in the countryside will be safer than the ones living in the big capital city of Budapest. So this lady came up to Budapest and asked my mother if she would let me go with her to the country to my grandparents. My mother had to make a decision in a very short time and um, she knew that nothing about my father. We didn't know anything about the rest of the family at that point. And she decided that she's gonna keep me with her and whatever will happen to her will happen to me. We didn't know that approximately three weeks after this, when she went back without me to the country, my grandparents, my younger aunts and aunts, uncles were all herded into the wagons, first to a ghetto for a few days and then into the wagons. And they took them to Auschwitz-Birkenau. So if my mother would have not made that decision to keep me with her, I most likely would have held my grandmother's hand walking into the gas chamber and I would not be here to talk to you. Um, they were all taken to Auschwitz and most of them were going straight into the gas chambers and the, the stronger ones and the younger ones were put to work for the Nazi regime. Um, by this time, They put up signs on the left side, you can see it, that every Jew had to go into the ghetto. Uh, they moved out all the Gentile people from the ghetto apartments and buildings, and from, they moved in a lot of Jews from the surrounding areas. We all had to have the yellow star of David on our clothing, whether it was a baby or an older person, we all had to have that on our clothing. Um, the um, ghetto, we had a one small one bedroom apartment and they moved in three other families to be with us. Uh, one day my mother received a message from an old neighbor of ours who was not Jewish that she was going to give us some bread if we are able to make it to her, to the stand where she was selling bread. And my mother took the yellow star off my clothing and told me where to go and to get the bread. Now, she had no idea if she will ever see me again, because if anybody would have pointed at me that I'm Jewish and I'm not wearing the yellow star of David, they could have shot me right there and or taken away from there. Now this lady who gave me the bread, which she did, she had taken a tremendous uh, risk because uh, if anybody would have said to the police or the Arrow Cross or anybody that she is giving food to a Jewish person, she would have had the same ending, either being killed right then and there or uh, taken away from there. Um, on the Hungarians up to that point, to, to the best of my knowledge, were fighting on the German side, but they didn't like it. They saw what's going on already, that maybe the war will be lost for Germany. So they wanted to pull out from that alliance. And um, the Germans got hint of this, and from one night to the other, on March 19, 1944, they invaded Hungary, which was the last country for them to invade. We were crowded into the um, ghetto, and um, it wasn't easy. Um, my mother, before this, was able to make her way to a flea market and um, she got hold of some old clothes, brought at home, mended it, washed it, ironed it, so on, and took it back many times on the same day. So um, 
she could make a little bit of money for us to live on. But that didn't go on too long. She couldn't do it because we were not allowed to leave the ghetto. But by this time, we had to go down to the basement or bunker. We call, that's the basement where we used to keep the coal and the wood for our heating our apartments and for cooking. Um, we were spending a lot of time down in the basement because the bomb started to fall over Budapest. In our building, we got three of them. Three bombs fell and uh, it killed a lot of people. And uh, we were afraid. One day my mother was on the ground floor doing, trying to do some cooking when um, the bomb fell and she ran down the stairs not knowing if she will find me alive or not. We had that stairs, those stairs was the only thing that connected us with the ground floor. So the people in the basement saw this and they were afraid what happens if the bomb will uh, take away the stairs from us and we won't be able to get out. So some of the people decided that on both sides of our building, at the basement level, they tore down the walls and uh, that would be a way to get out if we needed to. Except on one side, they found a double wall because the manufacturer of a goose liver um, factory had put his existing cans on shelves in there and walled that in, thinking that he will uh, be able to start his business again when he returns. Unfortunately, he had never made it. He did not come back. And for about two weeks in the ghetto, when everybody was starving and dying from hunger and illness and so on, he, uh, we lived on goose liver. By this time, there was a new party that sprang up, the Arrow Cross. Uh, these were most of them young people, I would call them young punks, who many a times the gun was bigger than they were. And they've, the only thing they wanted was to catch and kill as many Jews as they possibly can. One day they came into the, our building and ordered everybody downstairs. And um, uh, my mother was holding me in her arm and I was uh, crying. I didn't like all the commotions. So one of these kids didn't like my crying and ordered my mother back upstairs to our apartment. We lived on the third floor. And a few days later, the same thing, everybody had to come down. And at that time, I was just looking around. So my mother took her fingers, point, pinched my behind, and I started to holler all again. And that saved us because a lot of people who were taken away, we never ever heard from them again. Um, the third time they came into our building was not so happy. It didn't turn out so happy because there was no crying, nothing, they couldn't care less. And they ordered everybody to line up and start walking. Now at this time we had my father's great aunt with us. So the three of us were walking as they took us on the banks of the Danube River. I can tell you that, that I had seen two or three people tied together. So the Nazis would only have to use one bullet to shoot them into the freezing cold water. Then they took us to a place that we called it the Nazi house. We had no idea what it was and they made everybody throw down ev everything that was left as far as jewelry goes or valuables. And I can remember my mother taking off her wedding band and throwing it down on that blanket. They took us into a big room facing the wall, hands up, and we were there from morning till night. Now the great aunt told me later, I do not remember this, I have to be honest, that she told me to eat the one and only apple that we had between the three of us. 
And supposedly I said, I'm not going to eat that because who knows if and when we will have any food again. We don't know why they took us there. Maybe they wanted to show us that they can do whatever they want with us, how they were shooting in the, uh, the people into the Danube River or whatever. They can do whatever they feel like. But they ordered us out in the evening at night and made us go back to the ghetto. Then a man had arrived in Budapest named Adolf Eichmann. His only thing that he wanted to get rid of all the Jews of Europe, and since Hungary was the last country, they, he came to Budapest to try to make arrangements for that. Uh, it's very difficult for me to tell you, but in eight weeks, they managed to take away and kill close to 408,000 people and murder them, most of them in Auschwitz, Birkenau. That same time, approximately at the same time, in 1944, a young man from Sweden arrived. Go ahead. Uh, his name was Raoul Wallenberg, and he was a very um, well-to-do Swedish man who studied in the US and who had studied in Palestine and so on. And he just simply could not understand how can all these things going on in Europe with the Jews. So he managed to get some money still from North America and from England. And he approached the Swedish king and with his permission, and he had given him the um, uh, uh, papers to be able to make it to Hungary, the diplomatic papers, and he arrived in Budapest. He, the only thing he wanted to do was save as many Jews as he possibly can. Uh, he issued this uh, Schutzpass, which was the uh, legal papers, that uh, if anybody had this Schutzpa in their hand, they were a Swedish citizen and nobody can touch them. He used that, he gave them out at railroad stations and all over the place. Even with the money that he had on him, he bought up some apartment buildings and, uh, I'm sorry, and um, hung out the Swedish flag. And I don't know how, but my mother was able to get hold of one of the Schutzpes and we moved into the safe house, which we call them the safe house. Um, the conditions were not much better than they were in the ghetto, except if you try to step out from the uh, buildings and the arrow cross, these young kids were usually hanging around there trying to catch anybody they possibly could. Um, it was a terribly, terribly cold winter in Hungary in 1944 to 1945. And all the faucets were frozen, except one had dripping water on the ground floor. So we all had to line up to be able to get some water from there for drinking or for cooking. And that friend of mine that I showed you who sent me the Hanukkah picture, I'm in touch with her, she still lives in Hungary. Uh, she asked me not too long ago if I remember that her mother and mine, they went out to the courtyard of the building and collected snow and brought that inside. And that's what, after it's melted, that's what we used for hygienic reasons to clean ourselves. Time was going by, but I cannot tell you why, but we managed to go back to the ghetto. I don't know if my mother thought it was better there or we had a chance to do it or what reason, but we did end up back in the ghetto. Actually, our apartment building was part of the ghetto because the ghetto was on the best side of Budapest. And um, one day in January, we were downstairs in the basement 
and the strange uniform young man was coming down the stairs with a huge gun in his hand. And even us, the kids, my friends and I, we knew the Nazi uniform, we knew the Aerocross uniform and all that, but we had never seen one like this. He was coming down the stairs and with the gun because he didn't know whom he is going to face. It could be a Nazi who changed clothing with a Jew and trying to hide or whatever. And then he saw this man saw my girlfriends and I huddled in the corner and with his other hand, one hand held a gun and with the other hand, he reached into his knapsack and gave us a piece of bread. It was very, very unusual. I haven't faced anything like that before when a soldier would give us food. And with translators, he managed to let us know that we have been liberated and we can go and do whatever we feel like. Now, where do you go? We haven't heard from my father or from other family members. We didn't know what was going on. So we went upstairs to our own apartment, tried to stay there, except I couldn't see. For about three weeks, my mother was told to, by somebody to let me open my eyes just a few minutes more each time and my eyesight will come back because it was not used to daylight. We spent so much time in the basement. It took approximately three weeks until I recovered. People were start stopping each other on the streets asking questions about their families. If you were in a camp, did you know such and such? My mother, my father, my siblings, and so on. And um, not too much good news we heard. Uh, some people started to come home and um, we got news after that, that uh, one of my father's brother and one of my mother's sister, after they were liberated from the camps, uh, they were taken to the Soviet Union, which liberated us, and um, put to work for them. They did not make it back to Hungary until 1947. My mother had no choice. She went to the flea market again and did the same thing with the clothes, cleaned it up and took it back and sold it so we would have some money to buy food stuff and to live on it. Then one day she was in the uh, flea market and I was looked after by the great aunt sitting on a stool, stool in front of our building when a man started to come toward us. As he got closer, he started to run. And when he reached us, he picked me up, hugged me, kissed me. And I didn't recognize my own father. I have not seen him since 42, and this was August of 1945. I didn't remember him, I didn't at all. And of course he was asking about my mother, if she's alive and what do I know, or what the great aunt knows anything about the rest of the family. And we didn't have too much good news to tell him, but I can't believe it. Even today, the reunion, how it was when my mother came home and found my father alive. He wasn't well. He had gone through a lot. He was, he ended up after the first forced labor camp, he ended up in the Mauthausen concentration camp. From there, they, he was on a death march to Buchenwald and that's where he was liberated. And it took him all this time from until August, until he made his way home. He had to have surgery right away and he became somewhat better. And uh, he went out and looked for a job, which he got. And my mother uh, went back to work and they enrolled me in school. For four years, I went to parochial school but by after the four years, the government nationalized all the schools and um, I had to go to public school. 
the Hungarians did not like it very much to live on the under the communist regime. So in 1956, October the 23rd, a revolution broke out in Hungary. And that made that possible for the people who wanted to leave to make their way close to the border and from their pay off people to help them to cross into uh, Austria. Actually, we left my parents and I left Hungary on December the 9th, 1944. And after that, pardon, 1956. And we made our way and paid off some people who helped us cross the border into Vienna. Um, on, from December the 9th, 1956, it took us a month until January the 9th, when we arrived in Canada in Halifax at Pier 21. From there, we made our way to Montreal, where I had one of my uncles who never went back to Hungary. After he was liberated, he made his way to Paris, France, picked up the language, and moved to Montreal, Quebec. So we made it into Montreal. After a while, on the very same day when I arrived in Montreal, I went to register for school. Uh, in those days, I had a choice of choosing English or French, and I had chosen English. And I wanted to finish my high school. And after that, I went to Sir George William College. And I can tell you that up to today, I have never, ever stopped learning. I'm doing a lot of reading. And uh, I've always been going to school. Even later on, I attended York University, Seneca College. And I kept on going to school. And I ended up working for the North York Board of Education in Toronto after we moved to Toronto. And I was working with special ed kids. Uh, in 1958, I was invited by an acquaintance of mine to her wedding, and that's when I met my husband, who was the brother of the groom. On the left side, you see our engagement party and uh, engagement picture, and on the right side, you see our wedding pictures. My husband was Hungarian, and he went through the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. And he survived, thank God. And we met, and 25 months later, we got married in the same synagogue in Montreal. He lived in Hartford, Connecticut at that time. And I went to live in Hartford also. And while living in Hartford, we had two children. We have two wonderful daughters, both married, and each of them gave us two wonderful, wonderful grandchildren. On the left side, there is a picture of uh, my family because the kids threw us a 50th wedding anniversary party. And on the bottom left, you see a picture with my father still, and Rachel's mother just graduated from Osgood at that time. She's a lawyer, and my other daughter became a CA. Now, a number of things happened then because uh, he, um, my late father-in-law insisted on it that the three boys, my husband and his two brothers, should start opening their own business, which they did. And it was called FGL Precision Works, F for Frank, G for George, and L for Leslie. And they worked for the plastic industry, and they made molds for all over the world, from Israel to Europe to South America to Canada and all that. And um, we were doing okay, but the time was going by. And I was working after the kids started um, school. 
my husband got involved when he retired. He got involved in Neuburger and um, mm -hmm. he was talking to a lot of people speaking. And it's very, very important to do it and to speak and tell people what we had gone through and so on. I always tell the children, the younger ones, that I'm not going to tell you a story because you can sit down and make up a story. I'm going to tell you my experiences. Now about Roland Wallenberg. After a few country had made him honorary citizen, Canada did also. And soon after that, they issued a stamp with him, his picture on it. And um, I don't even think it's available anymore at the post office, but I was honored to um, uh, unveil that stamp here in Toronto. One day I got a phone call from the Swedish embassy in Ottawa that they invited me to go to the Capitol building in Washington to um, where Wallenberg's family was to receive the gold medal of honor. My husband came with me and we went to Washington. I think Mr. Cutler was with us. And uh, occasion then. Um, One day I got a call from here from Toronto that Queen's Park was going to honor me. And my husband was honored in, nine, in 2010. And a few years later, they asked me to go down to Queen's Park. It was before the pandemic. And you can see my whole family there. On the right side is my brother-in-law, my husband's younger brother. The other one had passed away by then. What can I tell you? It wasn't easy, but I do believe that it's important that we tell our experiences to generation after generation. They should know what was going on and what was happening then. And I didn't have a chance to tell you that all the pictures from my early childhood that you had seen, they were saved by a man who was a neighbor of my grandparents. And before they took my grandparents and the family away to Auschwitz, he went over and told my grandfather he was going to dig a hole in his own backyard and put everything valuable that they want to save in there. And he's going to keep it there until they come back. He didn't say, if you come back, he said, when you come back. And he did kept, keep his word and he did give everything back to the first person from the family who came back. So those pictures were saved and that's why I have them. This is the last picture on my grandson's bar mitzvah a few weeks before my husband passed away. After 57 years of marriage, he left me. He was ill, he was getting on in age and so on. And I miss him tremendously. I would like to tell you, show you and tell you two quotes that I like to finish with whenever I'm speaking. One of them was by Martin Lee Miller. And he said these words from the pulpit. He said, first they came for the communist and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the trade unionist, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for me, and by that time, no one was left. Because of these words that he said from the pulpit, they threw him in a concentration camp, but thank God he survived. The other quote is much shorter. He was a, George Santayana was a modern philosopher. And he said, those who cannot remember the past, I condemned to repeat it. Think about it, how important it is to keep on telling the people what we had gone through 
all the horrors and everything, because I definitely don't want my past to be their future. That is why I'm speaking. That is why my husband did. And actually, after we both retired, we made our way sometimes as snowbirds to Florida and we became involved there also with the Holocaust Center. And we are speaking to not just hundreds, but thousands and thousands of people in schools, synagogues, churches, libraries, wherever we have a chance because people have to know. And I can tell you that, that when I'm speaking to younger children, I always tell them that you are not learning for your, for your parents or for your teachers. You are learning for yourself because you never know the knowledge you have, how can it affect your life? And I can tell them honestly that in Bergen-Belsen, the knowledge had kept my husband alive. Thank you very much for listening to me and for attending. Thank you for sharing your experience with us today. As your granddaughter, I'm very proud of you. And I know that reliving this every time you speak is extremely difficult, but as an Osgood student, I know everyone here is grateful that we can learn from you to ensure that we do not repeat the mistakes of the past. There are a couple of questions that came into the chat while you were speaking. And the first question is, did you maintain a relationship with your religion after the Holocaust? Some family members were more religious after the war and some were less. My husband and I knew that it was important to keep the Jewish faith alive, particularly because of what we lived through. We definitely taught Jewish traditions to our children. We are not Orthodox as uh, my grandparents were, but we are keeping the Jewish traditions alive. Thank you. And then our last question of the evening is, are there any key messages you want us to take away from you uh, from this talk this evening? I always have hope. You have to have hope and never ever be a bystander because one person can make a difference. Look at Raoul Wallenberg, one person, what he has accomplished and keep on learning for yourself. You have to. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass it off over to Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Ava, for telling us about your story. I haven't had a chance to thank uh, Irving Cutler for the kind words that he used when we were talking. Thank you very much, Irving. Thank you for everybody who came to attend today to listen to Ava's story and for all of our panelists today for taking the time to be part of this important event. Um, from the Osgood J Jewish Law Student Association and from all the other Jewish Law Student Associations that's joined us today, we want to thank you for being part of this. You're very welcome. Thank you for listening.